welcome to the session, Managing Mental Health, Ambiguous Grief, and the Impacts of Diagnosis and Disease Progression. My name is Darcy Esiason, and I am a psychotherapist, and I am also a rare spouse. My husband lives with cystic fibrosis. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our topic today, which is mental health, but it's really centered around this concept of ambiguous grief, which is a term that not many of us use that often. So I'm going to go ahead and define it and talk about it a little bit. Ambiguous grief is the grief experienced from the loss of a loved one who is still alive, accompanied by a change of your relationship. And the distress associated with ambiguous grief may occur in the days, months, or even years before the death of a loved one. And ambiguous grief is the result of ambiguous loss, which is when you lose a loved one, but there is either no verification of the death or no certainty that the person will come back or return to the way that they used to be. Um, and there are two types of ambiguous loss. One is when there is physical absence with psychological presence. So an example of that would be if a loved one goes physically missing. And the second type, which we'll mostly be focusing on today, is when there is psychological absence with physical presence, which is when a loved one becomes cognitively or emotionally missing per se. And this is accompanied with that significant change in the relationship. And naturally, ambiguous grief can be rather troubling um, because it can freeze you in a state of grief that isn't moving in any sort of direction, which prevents coping with or coming to terms with the loss. And as everyone here already knows, the rare disease community are trailblazers in every sense of the word, whether that means you're the one testing out brand spanking new treatments, or maybe it means your kid is the only one of six people in the world to have a certain diagnosis. So naturally it adds up that for the rare disease community, is also pioneering in terms of mental health. And by that, I mean that the psychological burden of living with rare disease or loving someone with a rare disease is not the standard psychological burden that a therapist is used to seeing. The depressive symptoms aren't your textbook depression. The feelings of hopelessness are not the result of a chemical imbalance in the brain. The worry you might experience on a daily basis might be what's keeping you alive. It's not an anxiety disorder. And of course, you don't just get grief like everybody else. You get ambiguous grief. Um, and so I'm going to share a brief story that I think highlights what I'm getting at here. And this is a story from six years ago when my now husband Gunnar and I were first dating. And one evening we were watching a movie and he happened to be dealing with a nasty lung infection at the time. So he had a pick line in and he was doing home IV antibiotics. So we just started this movie when all of a sudden he said, oh my God, my butt is super itchy. So naturally I was like, okay, so scratch it. And he did, but the itching didn't go away. And what happened next was that he spiraled into a full-blown panic attack about his itchy butt. And at first I didn't really understand what was happening, but then it became clear that the source of his panic was the idea that if he had itchy butt cheeks, and then perhaps he was having an allergic reaction, and if he was having an allergic reaction, perhaps the allergic reaction was to the antibiotic that he was infusing, and if he was having an allergic reaction to this particular antibiotic, then that antibiotic would no longer be an option for him. And if he lost the ability to use that antibiotic, he'd be one step closer to an antibiotic resistant bacteria in his lungs and one step closer to untreatable cystic fibrosis and hence one step closer to death. So his instant thought process was itchy butt to death. So you know, I am a therapist and I know how to treat anxiety and I know how to treat panic attacks. So I started using the tools in my tool belt to try to help him out. You know, I'm doing CBT. I'm helping him combat his negative thinking. I'm trying to help him problem solve. And shocker, nothing I did helped, even the tiniest bit. And I just ended up riding out the panic attack with him, and I don't think either of us slept that night. So the next day I was beating myself up for not being able to help my own boyfriend with his anxiety when I literally treat anxiety for a living. When I finally realized he was having anxiety, yes, but it was not the kind of anxiety that I knew how to treat like the back of my hand. So anxiety by definition is a disproportionate response to a stressor. So for example, fear of flying or fear that everybody in a room is quietly making fun of you. But what Gunnar was going through that night was actually perfectly rational if you think about it. Living with a rare and serious illness, it's like actually pretty logical to think that a random itch might be indicative of something that could be pretty bad. And although that feeling of worry caused him a lot of distress, he wasn't willing to abandon those scary thoughts and that horrible feeling like I was trying to force him to do because those scary, always on the defensive thoughts and that being 
super hyper attuned to any sensation in his body or what had kept him alive into his 20s. So why would he abandon his anxiety if it was a survival tool for him? So that's when I first realized that in the world of rare disease, there are no tools to assess, measure, and define mental health issues as they relate to the lived experience of illness. And even worse, the mental health interventions that 99% of therapists are trained in don't adapt to the lived experience of illness. And that's why I met my now colleague, Dr. Virginia O'Hare, who you will meet in a second. And she's also quite the trailblazer. She is a psychologist. And what she does is she develops mental health interventions that are specific to life with rare disease. And actually more specific than that, she develops mental health therapies that are specific to individual diseases. And she's totally awesome and totally filling a void that very few other people are filling. So I'm thrilled to pass the baton to her and let her say a little more about herself. Thank you. Thanks, Darcy. Hi, I'm Virginia O'Hare. And like Darcy mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist with expertise in behavioral medicine. So particularly when psych factors intersect with health factors. So for example, somebody who might have been functioning just fine from a psychological perspective, and then gets a new diagnosis of a life threatening illness, of course, they're going to be experiencing anxiety, depression, anger, grief, et cetera. Um, and similarly, I've worked with a lot of folks with stigmatized um, conditions like HIV um, and extensively with cystic fibrosis, which is how I paired up with Darcy. And Darcy and I together founded the Esiason O'Hare Institute for Behavioral Medicine, where our mission is to make sure that we have appropriately tailored psychological interventions to really help folks with rare diseases that others might not get. So that, you know, there can be nothing lonelier than going to therapy because you know, your doctor said you should, and then getting to therapy and having to explain what your disease is or what your child's disease is, and be, you know, spending your good money educating this therapist about the rare diseases that you're dealing with. And so our, our mission is we kind of have this process where we meet with individuals who are living with or whose family or children are living with a rare disease. Um, so we've done this with cystic fibrosis, um, pancreatic cancer, HIV, and currently we're looking into ALS. Um, so talking with people who you know, are members of those communities and helping to really tailor an intervention that's not just change strategies, but that also has a really deeply rooted acceptance component. So my hope is that we'll be able to see some of those interventions in practice, um, which goes so far beyond when Darcy says that we're trailblazers together, you know, so far beyond lying on your couch and talking about your mom. This is more like weird experiential things that you can do to actually change your relationship to thoughts that might be hijacking you. Um, whether these thoughts are real or not. And in the most case, you know, for the most case, um, these thoughts will be real. Thoughts about dark future outcomes. We're not going to be able to think you out of those thoughts. We're, we're not going to be able to challenge those thoughts because what if they're reality? And so instead, how to move towards what you want to be about, even with those thoughts. So we'll get to see a little bit of that in action in just a few minutes, but I'd like to pass the torch to Jessica to tell us a little bit about her. Thank you so much. And I'm actually uh, eager to hear about some of those weird experiential things we can do because I'm sure I could use them. Um, I am Jessica and I am the mother of three kids. Uh, my children are 14, 16 and 19. My husband and I adopted all three of our kids from Guatemala when they were young. My 16 year old has primary diagnosis of Murph syndrome, which she was diagnosed with at age five. So she had been developing relatively normally until that time. Then she was diagnosed with a mild to moderate hearing loss, which led us to genetic testing, which led us to the diagnosis of Murph syndrome, a rare degenerative form of mitochondrial disease. Of course, when we got that diagnosis, we knew we had never heard of Murph syndrome. I did not really know what mitochondria were or why we needed them. I didn't really even fully get what a degenerative disease meant. But I learned over the next few years, as I saw that 
the, my daughter's functionality was starting to diminish in a variety of ways. But still overall, she was relatively healthy until age nine when she caught a cold that landed her in the hospital that became pneumonia that led to a three month stay in the hospital where she really, really lost much of her functionality. So that by the time we left the hospital when she was nine, she had a trach, she was vent dependent, she had a G-tube, she couldn't walk anymore, she couldn't swallow, couldn't talk, couldn't eat. Um, and yet she was still full of vim and vigor. She still was very feisty. She still um, was able to mouth, was able to make herself understood. And we progressed that way for several years. And then about three years ago, she was diagnosed with a secondary diagnosis of Lee's disease. Um, there are six others known in the world who have followed this pattern. And uh, that has been very progressive as well, so that now she is um, totally frozen. She cannot move at all. She cannot even blink her eyes. So uh, this notion of ambiguous grief is one that speaks to me very powerfully. Um, and it's one that I just learned about. So I had for many, many years felt like I am not going to grieve a child who is still with me. I'm looking right at her. I'm not going to grieve her. That doesn't feel right. And yet we were suffering together as a family. And of course, most profoundly her loss after loss after loss, the loss of being able to move, to speak, to communicate, et cetera. And so here I was asked to talk about ambiguous grief. And I was like, sure, you know, I'm always happy to talk about Dahlia. I'd like to spread the word about mitochondrial disease in general. And so I looked up ambiguous grief and I was like, oh my God, this is, this is exactly what I have been feeling and what we've been dealing with all these years. This idea that we have experienced so much loss while we still have this person we love so deeply here with us. And that's a really complicated feeling. Um, and, and I was really gratified to know that there's actually a term for it and that it's a thing. And I feel like, you know, naming it kind of gives me permission to feel it. So this idea of ambiguous grief um, really hit me quite strongly. So I'm looking forward to exploring that more over the course of this conversation. And again, learning some of those exp weird experiential things we can do to help deal with some of the feelings. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Parvathy. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Global Genes, for giving me an opportunity to share our story, um, my family's story, with all of you. Uh, I'm mom to two um, kids with rare and ultra rare conditions combined. Both my children have about four rare diseases. My son, Yash, is 13 now, um, but his uh, journey with rare diseases started about seven years ago when he was six. Um, at the age of eight, he had his um, he had colon cancer, so they removed his colon and, and all of that. Um, but long story, really long story short, um, we learned that he has a ultra rare disease. He's the only one in the world that we know of with his particular genetic mutation that predisposes him to all cancers, specifically in the GI tract. So since then, um, for the last seven years, we have. Um, gone back and forth from North Carolina to Boston Children's to Sick Kids Toronto. We have gone where we have to go to get him the care that he needs. Um, my daughter, Ira, was born when my son was six years old, and we had just started the diagnostic odyssey, but she was born with a condition called Bardet Beetle Syndrome. Um, we thought it was really cute that she was born with extra toes and fingers, um, but as she started growing and developing, um, she was called a morbidly obese um, infant because she had gained a lot of weight. She went from four pounds, 10 ounces to 30 pounds exclusively breastfed. Um, and that was one of the indicators that there was a possible genetic condition. They diagnosed her with Bardet Beetle. Um, they gave us, uh, the, I, I will never forget the day the geneticist gave us a printout and said she has this condition. Um, you know, she'll be morbidly obese. Um, she will be developmentally delayed and will go blind through her life because that's that's what comes with this condition. So that was our um, opening. And through her life, um, we, we learned that she had multiple other rare diseases. And um, when this topic came about grief, it was interesting because we as a family have gone through very many different facets of grief. Um, we did anticipatory grief. My uh, <clears throat> daughter went into hospice and palliative care. So we knew death was coming. We didn't know when. Um, we had ambiguous grief. And this was, I didn't know, much like Jessica, that it was termed ambiguous grief for the longest time. And I continue to say this. I today grieve the child I lost, but I continue to grieve the child who is with me because 
we grieve the life that we have lost or we had envisioned. You know, our life is very fruitful. We're very thankful for our son. Um, but when you become a parent or, or when you think of yourself as a parent, you always envision yourself. You know, you plan your life. We were those helicopter parents who had everything planned. Our child's doing this and this and this. Um, and we lost all of that the day he fell sick and the day with each diagnosis, with each, which, with each hit that our family got, we went further away from the life we had envisioned. And to me, that has been a part of the grief journey that we've gone through. And so all of the definitions here fit um, our personal experiences. And that was one of the reasons um, I was so happy that I got to share it on this stage because I'm hopeful that others are also out there who feel this and can relate to this and also give it the grace that it needs because we all need, need that acceptance. Like Jessica said, if it's not def defined, then there is no way to address it. So back to you, Darcy. Oh, you're muted, Darcy. Sorry, I'm muted. I was just going to say, Virginia and I are going to talk about some of the ways that you might be able to ease the effects of ambiguous grief. So go ahead, Virginia. Great. So when Darcy and I were thinking about this talk, we were thinking about the experience of sort of having, having one's life on hold like, and this sort of at the same time feeling kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. And how the goal is not to, not to try to change that narrative, not to try to change the channel on any of that experience, which is real, and see, is there a way to make room while being with that, you know, things are deteriorating, the future could be dark, the future will be dark, and the other shoe will drop. So not taking a Pollyanna approach at all. And at the same time, how can that be balanced on the other side with how can we really double down on angling ourselves, orienting ourselves towards values, what we want to be about as individuals and as a family? So if you think about ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, that's where we draw a lot of these interventions from. But we also draw some from dialectical behavior therapy, DBT um, and radically open dialectical behavior therapy, RODBT. I know the names are kind of weird, but whatever. Um, so ACT is all about, I can kind of tell you what ACT is, but better is to sort of demonstrate. So does anyone have with you a heavy book or binder? So imagine, oh, and I noticed that my background is kind of not very forgiving of this. Here we go. So imagine that this binder, and you can grab one if you so choose. I like that part of these looking around for one. Um, <laughs> Imagine that this binder or heavy book represents all of your anxieties and depressions and miseries. Oh, yeah, Jessica. All of your fears. Oh, yeah, probably way, way to make it work. All of your fears for the future, all of your grief that you're feeling now, all of the wish it was different. Why is it like this? Should it could have would all of the plans that got you know flipped upside down? And so the, this binder, this book represents that. So what do you want to do? You want to get rid of it. So say you put all of your effort into pushing it away from you. So it's way away, shoving it away with both arms. Now, if we were in person, I would be pushing hard against one side and you'd be pushing back against the other. It'd be an actual physical struggle. And so while you're doing this, while you're putting so much energy into trying to push away all of these painful experiences, how able are you to pet your dogs? to cook a nice meal, to spend some time reading to your child for fun. How able are you to play a sport, change the channel on TV, engage with your partner, etc.? Probably not that able because you got this book in the way. But what if instead, instead of trying to push it away, what if you kind of gently held it in your lap? And that's sort of the stance of act is we're not getting rid of any of this pain. We're not saying it's not there. We're not giving a trick to get rid of it. We're kind of changing people's relationship to it. So a lot of human suffering comes from trying to push away thoughts or painful inner experiences. You know, that's where people get into all sorts of distractions. It could be drinking, drugging, kind of denying, putting head in the sand, compulsive distraction, workaholism, all of that stuff. And ACT is saying instead, what if you hold this lightly in your lap? It's still there. But now at least your hands are free to do all those other things that you might want to do as a family or as individuals. 
So that's kind of act in a nutshell, this idea of not pushing away painful inner experience, allowing space for it, accepting it, so that then you can move forward to what you wanna be about. And then when you think about what you wanna be about in terms of values, think about what do you want written about you on the dust jacket of the book of your life? So you know you get like when you splurge and get a hardcover book, and you open it up and there on the inside is that author panel information about that person's life. What would you want written about you on the dust jacket of your life? You know, and think about what's important there. And there's lots of ways to get at values. We do values card sorts. There's an app called values card sort that's free, that's great. Um, we do all kinds of exercises like what do you want people to say about you at your 90th birthday? What do you want written on your great or your tombstone on your gravestone. And the, the idea of kind of what do you want in the dust jacket of your book is thinking like, what do you want to stand for? What do you want to be remembered for? And how can you kind of angle yourself towards that now? Maybe as a family, maybe just you. So one thing that often comes up when people think about moving towards their values, oftentimes pain comes up. So values and pain are kind of two sides of the same coin. There can be a huge gut punch of pain recognizing either, oh, wow, I'm not living my values, or my values are not what I thought that they were going to be, or not what I had planned when I'd envisioned my life you know, years ago. So one thing that can come up when we try to move towards our values are these barriers that our minds churn out that really can kind of keep us stuck. They could be a thought or a phrase that really haunts us. So... Imagine right now, imagine a glass of milk. Imagine a tall, cold, gluggy glass of white milk. You could imagine the bubbles. You could imagine blowing down the straw. <laughs> there it is. You could imagine sipping it. Maybe you're like me and you're lactose intolerant and the idea makes you want to vomit. You know, <laughs> so imagine this milk. So now what we're gonna do, and you can either unmute or not, however you so choose, is as many times as possible, say the word milk. Ready, set, go. Milk, 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 milk. And now when you think milk, like does it even represent milk anymore? Like where it's kind of useless sounds. Now I find myself saying milk, and like, where did the white gluggy go? So similarly, if you think about a word or a phrase that haunts you, you think about the neural network that's activated when that word comes up. So a word that Darcy and I have used with Darcy's now husband, Gunner, is transplant. So for a lot of people with cystic fibrosis and a lot of people with other lung disease, transplant, having a you know, solid organ lung transplant represents the ticking start of a clock to that organ eventually failing. Transplant also represents changing, trading in one problem for this whole other problem, which yes, could be life-saving and comes with this, you know, whole regimen of immunosuppressants that have to be taken, like this whole other ball of wax. So that was the word that Gunner had identified as a word that haunted him. So we did this exercise together, kind of like the milk, 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 but we took it a little wackier. So now when Gunnar would think the word transplant, this whole neural network activates, and Darcy, you can chime in with what he would be thinking of, but I'm aware that he'd be thinking of ticking clock, you know, the illness getting worse, there's no coming back, trading one set of problems for another. What else do you think he would think of with transplant? Is the future's over, not being able to be a father, not, you know, being terrified to go out in the great outdoors, not being able to go in the mm -hmm. sun, not being able to eat the same things. And he, Pain. he really could never talk about it. The word just couldn't come up. I mean, if he saw it completely out of context in like a book or some article on the internet, he had to immediately close it out because it was just mm -hmm. a scary word. It's like avoid, avoid, avoid all reminders. Yeah. But that, then we did this wackery. Are you ready? So Darcy and Gunner and I, um, said the word in all kinds of different ways. So first we just said it back and forth, normal, transplant. 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 And then we got a little weird. Transplant. 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 Woof, 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 transplant. <sighs> transplant. Transplant. 
Transplant. Transplant. <laughs> Transplant. <laughs> and so it's not like when now when he hears transplant, the same horrible neural network lights up of all of the you know ball of wax of negativity that comes with transplant. But also this new neural network lights up, lights up where he thinks about us laughing hysterically about different accents, different dogs, cats with transplant. So it just increases some psychological flexibility where there could be a block. Now we're certainly not saying that this is gonna solve any of life's problems, but more that if you're getting stuck and haunted by certain words or phrases or thoughts or patterns of thinking, we as humans can put ourselves in smaller and smaller and smaller boxes. Like don't say the word whatever, don't think the thought of such and such, don't visit this place, don't allow your mind to go to this other place. And those are the things that can really keep us stuck and keep us frozen from being present in the moment and living our values. Some of those things might also protect us from having to feel. So there is that as well. But the idea with defusion is that we're introducing new learning with the whole goal of never having to turn away from your own inner experience. So that is the true freedom will, you know, lies in not turning away from your own inner experience, not being scared of your thoughts, scared of your emotions, scared to like be triggered. So that's kind of where ACT, you know, really can help a lot. And what I hope is like a non-trite, non-Pollyanna way. And Darcy's going to tell us one last excellent ACT intervention. Perfect timing. One of my dogs is barking. Pass it to you. <laughs> I'm going to close out, like Virginia said, with one more act skill before we jump into our Q&A. And this is going to be another metaphor like the book because we just love metaphors. Um, so I want you to imagine that you're in a room with this big, giant, ugly monster. And that monster represents your life with rare disease and all the stress and all the guilt and all the horrible feelings and all the traveling from state to state to get treatment and the, the hunt for a diagnosis and just, quite frankly, everything horrible about the lived experience of rare disease. Now imagine there's also a bottomless pit between you and the monster, and you and the monster are also holding two ends of this rope. And you guys are playing tug of war. And if you lose, you're gonna fall into this big giant bottomless pit and be destroyed. So you're pulling and you're pulling, and the harder you pull, the harder the monster pulls, and you edge closer and closer to the pit, and it just goes back and forth, and you have this huge struggle with this monster. And what we talk about in Acts is that the crazy thing is to realize that playing the tug of war and winning tug of war is not the solution, but rather our job here is not to win tug of war. Our job is the one only other option, which is to drop the rope. So the goal of this metaphor is to not accept complacence or not like giving up against rare disease or the monster, but rather to see that letting go of a futile struggle is actually a viable option. Because when you let go of the rope, the monster is still there across that bottomless pit, it's still going to give you mean looks, still going to taunt you, still going to be horrible, but at least your hands are free. You know, you don't have that same uh, rope burn that you have on your hands every day. You can go hug your kid, kiss your spouse, call a friend, send some emails, do some laundry. And again, the monster is still there, still very present, but he can no longer harm you in the same way by taking up so much of your time and giving you that pain and perpetually just exhausting you in this, in this struggle. And of course, you will invariably pick up the rope again at times. And you'll find yourself in a real struggle with the monster and everything that he's taken from you. But the most important thing to remember is to have that aha moment and say, oh, I can just put this rope back down. Even if you have to put the rope down a hundred times a day, because at the end of the day, something that we believe um, in our therapeutic work is that the monster is a big problem in your life. Like obviously, of course, but the thing that we believe that's causing most of your distress isn't the monster. It's that struggle with the monster. It's that daily fight that you have with the monster and everything that the monster takes from you while you're spending so much of your time and energy pulling on that rope with him. Um, so those are some just very brief act skills. Um, some of many that we do in our practice and that we try to cater to um, the lived experience of illness. But now we are going to jump into our Q&A. So I just want to make sure, do we have everybody back up on screen and unmuted? 
All right, awesome. I am going to jump into a first prepared question while uh, Virginia sees what questions that we have from anybody listening. And the first question, I want to say, Jessica, I think it was you who in a previous conversation mentioned that the flip side of ambiguous grief is this concept that you called ambiguous joy. And yeah. I thought that was super interesting. Can you guys tell us a little bit more about that ambiguous joy? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I really appreciate what you said about not wanting to be Pollyanna. And I think that that's really important. Um, but when I think about the dust jacket of my life, which is another concept you just introduced that I like a lot, it it definitely has some something on it about wanting to make as much joy as possible every day. And that's something that we are pretty deliberate about in my house because we don't know how, you know, we, we say there's no light at the end of the tunnel, right? We're, we're not expecting there to be a light at the end of the tunnel. So what do we have? We have the tunnel. So let's try and make the tunnel itself as awesome as it can be. So I think that the flip side of ambiguous grief is ambiguous joy because you have complicated feelings about being happy, right? And so just like you have complicated feelings about grieving somebody who's still here, ha being happy when you're in this horrible situation isn't so clear cut. And yet I still think that it's much better to be trying and striving and having those moments where, you know, the monster's on the other side of the of the canyon, you're not even thinking about the monster. And yeah, it's not going anywhere, but if you can turn your head for a while and have joy over here, with your, you know, fa back facing the monster, that's, that's to me, a definitely an effort that's worth trying. I love that. And I would say like, a, giving yourself permission, not to ruin it by when's this experience going to end? I shouldn't be feeling this way. I feel guilty. I feel ashamed for feeling this way. So again, not turning away from your inner experience. And I love what you're bringing up here, Jessica, because I, we were talking about turning away from painful inner experience, but really what if, whatever inner experience is happening is viewed kind of the same as your reaction to the temperature around you. So you're not thinking like, oh, I shouldn't be putting on a sweater because no one else is, mm -hmm. right? If you're cold, you freaking put on a sweater. So similarly, if you're feeling joy, why, you know, why ruin it with, yeah. you know, like, why catch thinking, yourself and say, oh, I don't deserve this because I yes. have this whole other thing. Like you kind of deserve mm -hmm. it maybe even a little bit more. Even more. Yes. I love it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. One of the questions um, posed to the general group is there kind of three questions along a similar theme about um, should everyone have a therapist if you do if you have children with rare disease? And again, I, I'm also well aware that from talking with these ladies and other people who we, who we work closely with, sometimes there's just not going to be time. So I understand that too. There are some really great app, apps. So if you like ACT, which is what we're doing here, acceptance and commitment therapy, there's um, an app called ACT Coach. I think it's free. Um, so yes, I mean, I would definitely say in an ideal world, get support, of course. I mean, I kind of think that everyone should be in therapy all the time. And if it's not possible, there's a lot of ways to prioritize mental health, um, even outside of therapy, which I would always strongly encourage. Darcy, do you have another prepared question? Yeah, I also see two questions about how can I find a therapist um, who is experiencing rare disease and who knows this kind of stuff. And I want to answer that because this is like my personal passion in life, because unfortunately, the really crappy answer to this is there's not a good place to find therapists like that. My best like solution that I tell people is to go to psychologytoday.com and filter for um specific evidence-based treatments. I forget if they list it as like what kind of treatments or what kind of interventions. And I would check off the box for acceptance and commitment therapy, as well as dialectical behavioral therapy. Cause even if they're not experienced with rare disease, they're experienced with kind of different um, patterns that would work better for serious illness related psycho psychological burden. With that being said, there are most therapists I don't think are trained to deal with this stuff. That's actually what Virginia and I, our, our life's goal is to do, one of our long-term goals is to have an online database where you can go find someone who is experienced in the illness that you're dealing with. Um, and COVID has actually helped us with that because with all the telehealth therapy that's now being allowed, you'll be able to find someone who, you know, might be totally across the country, but knows about the disease that you're dealing with. But so the sucky answer is there's not a great place to find someone, but try psychology today. Or honestly, you can feel free to email me in Virginia. We'll make sure mm -hmm. that I'm in somewhere and we will help you find someone. 
And similarly, yeah. there's a question about um, how do I get my therapist to know more about my rare disease? I think as a therapist, it's legit to ask them to do some reading. I don't think you should have to use session time, paid session time to teach the therapist about the rare disease. So I would think if there was websites, if there's, again, databases, um, even global genes could be a great asset in that sense. And readings, you know, as a therapist, I welcome all of that information and I do that on my own time. Well, that as a medically complex family, I think it's, we learned very late that we should have gotten therapy a lot sooner. And I think, um, I mean, good golly, we all have packed lives, whether we have a job or taking care of our children can sometimes, it's a full-time job by itself. Um, we don't, we, we need someone to tell us to stop and give ourselves the grace. Um, I mean, just in our own family, you know, my child, my older child is going through grief as a sibling. He's going through grief of his own loss as his, uh, as how he sees life, you know, and he's going through a constant uh, battle of trying to see, okay, I'm healthy now, but I can get cancer again in three months. There's just so much that we are not equipped with. And we have that unique um, avenue where my child has an ultra rare disease, but he also has cancer. And so we see the two different approaches that the world takes. When you have cancer, you're automatically asked, how are you doing? How is your mental health? Do you need help? Do you need support? We have child life therapists, which we're very thankful for. So, you know, we are very, we're glad that we had that outlet to see the different approaches. You don't have that comprehensive approach because there is no one doctor that can take care of my child's rare disease. My daughter had doctors from head to toe. You know, she was nonverbal, extremely different from my child. People should have asked me and um, I, I wish had asked me, are, am I getting mental health help? Because are you, how are you how are you coping with the fact that one child won't shut up while the other child doesn't talk? Like, how are you taking care of it? Their needs are so different. I have to understand what one child is trying to tell while the other child doesn't stop talking. So it's like, OK, what what is what is important to you? What do you need? You know, we were fortunate that we were connected to complex care doctors. They don't exist in most a lot of places. We're fortunate that the complex care doctors are also cued in with palliative care because they all have therapy. We're glad we had a hospice team that does grief counseling and continues to do it. Once you're in hospice family, you're always there. But we learned that through the seven years we've gone through all of this. And we still don't have a rare disease therapist or a rare disease family, but we now know to ask questions and to, to feel free to change therapists if it doesn't work. So it's literally like, I have one, my husband has one, my child has one, we all have one together. I feel like there's not enough therapists, but, but use COVID as a positive experience because you can get um, sessions with therapists a lot faster now thanks to virtual appointments. So um, you cannot have enough according to me. <laughs> Yeah. It looks like, oh, sorry, go Darcy. Oh no, go ahead, Virginia. It looks like there's some more questions in the chat about kind of how to find a therapist and can, can we give our emails to help um, link with a therapist? So um, I'm putting mine in the chat right now with hopes that everyone can see and Darcy, maybe you wanna put yours too. And then um, another question about what do we do if we can't afford therapy? Which I get that too, right? I mean, not just time-wise, but also thinking about just the high cost. So I would think um, sometimes there's a way to get therapy through your child's health insurance. And other times we just have to think outside the box. So there's apps that accept the ACT coach app. There's also this book that I find life-changing, which is also from um, the ACT founder, Steve Hayes, called Get Out of Your Mind. I'm putting this in the chat and Into Your Life. Um, by Steve Hayes. And that's another really great sort of self-help. Um, and at the same time, my hope too, is that once the Assize and O'Hare Institute for Behavioral Medicine gets up and running, my hope is that we'll have kind of a larger infrastructure of, you know, not just referrals, but, you know, scholarships and ways to really get help to those who need it. So sometimes by looking at your specific family's rare disease, if there's a foundation, sometimes there's funding in there and other times there just isn't. And we got to find a way to think outside the box um, by kind of self-help, et cetera. You know, I wonder also about the idea of introducing palliative care maybe earlier than you might otherwise be inclined because 
I know for me, um, when Pat went very early on, palliative care was suggested and I was offended. I was like, you know, I thought palliative care was for people who were very close to the end. I didn't know anything about this world, you know, and when all of this, when we were first thrust into it. So we resisted and resisted for many, many years. And when we finally did um, seek out palliative care, we realized there's so much support and we don't pay a thing for it. So um, I don't know if that's because of where we live. I don't know if that's the, you know, if you're recommended for it, I, I don't know about that, but I would say that if palliative care is something that is offered to you, that there, that there are all kinds of supports that come along with it and not just for the, the uh, person with the disease, but for the entire family. And so, you know, my, my, child siblings have been able to have music therapy. They come to the house, the, the therapists, and they get to, you know, play their instruments and art therapy and all these things. And, and it's all part of palliative care. So I, I think that that was something I wish I had known a little bit earlier. I completely agree, Jessica. Huge plug for the palliative care team. Um, ours, uh, we were fortunate. Um, we pushed as well because we did not know, but we were also fortunate that they followed us along for two years. Um, so the first years of my daughter's like, we didn't have any. And we're like, yeah, we don't need it. Our daughter's not dying. Yeah. Complex right. care came in, um, which transitioned to palliative care. And, and at least with pediatrics, I know we have a lot of our adult patients here from the rare disease community as well. Um, and it goes the same for you as well. Palliative care does not mean end of life. It means that they have tools in their toolbox. They have a team of doctors and nurses and therapists and social workers who, who can help you in ways that no one else can. Um, they may, they, if they don't have all the answers, they will get you the answers and they can come to your house and give you the care so you don't have to do yet another trip to go visit someone. But um, for us, that was life changing because by the time we did get to that hospice stage, we were prepared. We were we knew we knew that we knew the, the pros and cons and we, we were ready to make that decision. But in my personal opinion, I feel like every every fam, every diagnosis, rare disease diagnosis that's progressive or involves more than one system or even one system should automatically have a palliative care consult just so that they can follow us along. My son has one. He's nowhere close to end of life. He is full of life and he still has a lot of aggressive treatments going on. But we advocated for him to have the palliative care team actively following him so that he can get all of these supports. So again, like just, I don't know what it involves. If you, if, if you're not hospice is completely free, everything is covered. I don't know about the palliative care part, but that's an option. The other option is also asking if your um, hospital has a complex care team. Um, if, if insurance doesn't cover your own visits for mental health, then asking if they have a complex care team because they do have special codes or even the doctors there have more time. And, and I can tell you out of all the specialists we see, our complex care doctor is the only one that's ever asked, looked at me, taken a deep breath and asked, how are you doing and what can we do for you? Um, so finding that team, finding that doctor, it took a long while, um, but, but find that team. So it may not be a specialist like Virginia or Darcy, but at least having someone ask you, how are you once in a few, every few months made me feel like, okay, I have someone to go to, should there be a need? Um, so, yeah. yeah, hugely important. And we have five minutes left of our Q&A. So I'm gonna ask a question that we had pre-planned to ask, but someone in the audience also asked it too. Um, to our moms, have you talked to your, um, your other children, the siblings, about topics around ambiguous grief? Yeah, so I learned a lot about this the hard way because for a very, very long time, our philosophy was to try to be super strong for the um, for all of the kids, but for the siblings. And so we really kept on a happy face, kept it in. And many years in, our eldest came to us one night and had gotten into some trouble and, and just really broke down and said, I don't understand, you and dad, you know, deal with it all so well, and you're not upset, and you're not scared, and you're not, so why do I feel that way? And I was like, oh my God, we have done such a disservice. And I mean, it was like shameful what I felt we had done. And here we were trying to be strong, you know, but not letting them see this ambiguous grief and that we were struggling made them think there was something wrong with them for having those complicated feelings. So we've done a complete 180 in the years since. And yes, we do talk about it more frequently. 
I was a little unique and awkward because we wish we had done it sooner. He was six when his journey started. His sister was born with the condition. We just, you know, there were times when we were in two different hospitals, each parent with one child. We were in the same hospitals, different floors, same floors. Um, she lived four lives, four years of her life with us, and they were complete and wonderful with all of these issues. Um, we never stopped at that time to think how our child, our older child, was processing all of this because we were in the thick of it and we were going through it. Um, I wish we had. But he was also really young. So there's no playbook that comes with how do you take care of two kids with rare diseases that are equally sick and or, you know, you're just trying to, you know, see the glass half full and pull it through and pull it along. Um, but I will tell you for us, for our particular family, that aha moment came when um, shortly after our daughter passed away, my son had to go um, into surgery and he lost two liters of blood. And it was just him and I at a Ronald McDonald house. And I was like, okay, let's go to the ER. And in front of me, I saw the child like lose color because of thought that he had that he was going to die now. And it was only then later he asked me, he said, weren't you scared that I was going to die? Like, how did you not think about that? Why did you not cry? How are you like, why did you just want to take me to the ER and like, will you cry if I die? That shifted my entire perspective because here I was thinking, oh my God, dad's not here. It's just me and him. We're in a Ronald McDonald house. Like we have to go, you know, do I do 911? Like these were my thoughts, but I didn't ever realize that he was watching me process it. And he was wondering why I was not more upset that he may potentially die. And that really changed it because it was like Jessica said, you know, it was it was life and death and I had to do what I had to do. But it also showed me that he needs to see my vulnerable moments. He needs mm -hmm. when I'm sad and I'm angry and I'm upset um, because he sees me as the stoic mom who's always like in the hospital, you know, with that, like telling the doctors what to do, what not to do, what it is. And, he, and, and sometimes he needs to see that other side where I do get angry or I do get sad. Um, and, and so for us. I wish we had talked about ambiguous grief without using that term because that may become too vague for him. Uh, but I hope that um, families, uh, spouses, you know, care partners, whoever you are, it exists. It's real, Darcy. And the example you gave about the transplant, we see it every single day in, in our child that can talk like, oh, my God, I, I fell down. I'm going to bleed and die. You know, it's like, OK, maybe. But but it's 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 real. And, and I hope that everybody has that understanding to validate themselves when they feel that. Somebody yeah, had yeah. put in the chat, that message needs to be sent up in a bat signal. Don't try to be strong for them. Very true. It's a disservice, yes. I feel like we could talk for another hour. We are coming to in here and there are office hours, mm -hmm. I believe for mental health right after this. So if anyone wants to continue in there that's that is where this conversation can continue thank you everyone so much for participating today thank you thank you global genes for making this space for such an important topic thank you